And we're live. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another week of uh, DiveSoft TV, another episode of Dive Talks Live. I'm your host, Joe Bosquez. I uh, hope everyone's doing great today. Uh, today, my guest is uh, author and technical diving instructor trainer, Mark Powell. Um, really excited to have him on the show today. Let's see if we can pipe him in. All right. Hello, Mark. How are you doing? I'm great, thanks. Yeah, very, uh, very good. Yeah, thank you for uh, joining us today. It looks like it's a little dark where you are. Uh, yeah, I am in my uh, mobile office, uh, classroom, equipment store, and uh, a media studio. Uh, my my van. I'm, I've been on, been teaching today, so um, I'm on the way back home. So, oh well. Uh, yeah. Well, great. You could join us. You know, it's good that you're out in the field out diving, you know, doing uh, I always say that it's if you're not diving, it's good to be talking about diving at least. So but you're out diving and teaching. So that's great. Yeah, I've done far too much talking about diving uh, this year. Uh, it's good to be back uh, actually doing it. Right, right. Yeah, you've had a, a number of live streams this year. Um, we've kind of all had to uh, adapt to 2020 and jump into or kind of get forced into uh, doing live streams but it seems to be pretty fun I don't know how's how's your experience been with that yeah I've done I've done a few um, for uh, for TDI and uh, guesting on a couple of, of others and uh, well like you said we, we've we were sort of forced into it but um, actually I think uh, you know some some things from lockdown it would be worth keeping and carrying on right. so I think this sort of format is going to is going to carry on even after uh, the COVID stuff has uh, has disappeared. Right, right. It was just kind of like a force nudge. It's like, yeah. oh, you you don't know what's good for you. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's it's been an exceptional tool. We've been able to get people from all over the world, and now we have people tuning in from far and wide. And you know, sometimes it's so hard to make schedules meet uh, schedules to match, and so now we're able to just do it from a cell phone, like you're doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, modern technology, uh, it, it definitely helps at times. Great. Just like Michael Menduno says, hey, talking heads. Yep, now we're all becoming talking heads. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> literally, it's about all you can see of me. Yeah, yeah. So, but just like everyone, you know, be sure to like and share and uh, also comment below if you guys have any questions for Mark. Um, so, um, yeah, so... Uh, you know, tell us, uh, tell our guests uh, a little bit about yourself and how you kind of uh, got into diving since you've been in the industry for such a long time. How'd you get into it? Um, well, I, I got into diving, uh, first of all, my, my very first uh, try dive was when I was age 10 in a, in a swimming pool. And um, actually, my father got me into, he started diving and he didn't progress. Uh, he didn't carry on with it. Um, but I did a try dive at the same time and absolutely loved it. I can still remember it now. I can still remember the feeling of being underwater and uh, the uh, amazement of being able to see underwater. Um, at the time, uh, certainly in the UK, you couldn't dive at that age. So um, it wasn't until I went to university that I, uh, I learned to dive properly. Uh, started diving in university, joined uh, a dive club afterwards and uh, and became an instructor and dived for a long time just as a, a recreational um, uh, part-time instructor um, and then gradually got more into tech diving and uh, became a tech instructor but again just as a hobby I never intended to to make a living out of it and then in 2004 uh, I had a chance to, to go full-time so um, I started teaching full-time and uh, yeah still here Right, right. Never look back. It's uh, it's you know, it's amazing how we. Uh, it's a kind of a common theme. I always ask all of the guests, like you know, your first experience diving, and everyone can kind of really vividly remember it. It really mm. puts an imprint on people's uh, people's brains and memory. So it's absolutely, it's always really cool. Yeah. The um, especially um, you know, and then like getting into teaching, you know, because you know. T Teaching is not for everybody, especially diving professionally, diving full time. It takes a, you know, kind of a certain commitment to the sport. And so and you have to really decide how to be uh, in order to pursue teaching and to teach scuba 
diving, alone technical diving, because a lot of people that when they're in scuba diving, they kind of just stick to scuba or the basic uh, sport diving rather than getting into technical diving. So. Yeah, and I think you're right. Diving is one thing. Teaching diving is something very different. You know, there's there's some overlaps because obviously you're diving. But I think in order to be a sex successful instructor and all and also in order, you know, as I said, it's been uh, what is it, 16 years full time. And mm -hmm. I was excited about going diving the, the, this morning um, because not so much the dive site. You know, it was it was a, a nice enough dive site that, you know, wasn't spectacular, but it wasn't the dive that got me up and excited this morning. It's the, the, the teaching and seeing the, the progress. So, you know, I think. If you want to be a, a diving instructor, you've got to really enjoy the process of teaching um, and enjoy having difficult students who you can then work with to, right. uh, to, to improve and work on. Right, right. I mean, um, my background, I, I kind of did a lot of diving in university as well. And then I, I taught diving at the university and it's structured so differently than, a, you know, a traditional dive shop would. Mm -hmm. You know, usually they have the students for, a, you know, for a whole semester, you know. And so they really get to spend the time in growing with that. And so it's uh, it really I think it really depends on the students when they have a very good experience in the beginning, how they stick with it. Yeah. And the same thing with teaching. If you're teaching and you are able to keep that passion and that drive up by, you know, introducing new elements and not getting burned out. It's something that you can really stick with for a long, long time. Yeah. I mean, you know, we, we both said it. We, we and other people um, have said it. The. If you remember your first dive, then that's going to stay with you. And if your instructor helps to create that memorable first experience, then they've helped to create a diver for a life. Um, it's one right. of the things that I'm re when I'm teaching instructors, uh, really passionate about is we, we don't want to just do an open water course with these guys. We want them to turn we want to turn them into uh, into divers. We want to make them passionate about divers. We want to make them into the, the sort of person that tells everyone they meet that they're a diver and how good the diving was that they did last weekend. Uh, um, and we want to generate that that next generation of enthusiastic divers. It's not about yet yeah, four dives in your open water diver. Uh, it is, you know, this is the start of your uh, of your journey. And you can't do that without without passion. You know, if you're an instructor and you don't really enjoy what you're doing, you're not passionate about it, you're not going to be passing that passion on to someone else. And it's it's right. it's sad, really, because you see a lot of instructors that lose the passion because they get yeah. bored of teaching. If they carried on diving, just diving for themselves, they might keep that that passion. You know, as an instructor, if you're not if you're not enjoying it, don't do it. Go and do something else. Go diving for for yourself rather than um, you know boring yourself and boring your students. Right, right. I you know I tell I tell everyone it's you know it's it's still a job and it's something that you got to keep. You have to keep it interesting. You know, you got into the job because of passion, right? And then, like, just like any job has a good side and a bad side. You got long days, you got hard days, or you can get kind of burned out on it. But if you, like you said, just go dive for yourself and go do new things. And the biggest thing I think is the the continual growth of, because I believe really progress is the key to fulfillment. So if you're always kind of working on yourself. And working on your skill set, on your certifications, your training, maybe, you know, getting into technical diving or new equipment in technical diving, you know, that really keeps things very interesting. You're able to progress and that, that'll make people feel very fulfilled. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. I, I was having a very similar conversation with my, uh, my dive master uh, today. And I like to do a different course every year, learn something new, um, diving related or, or not diving related. And yeah, you know, partly just to, to keep my brain active, but also mm -hmm. to remind myself what it's like to be a student, how how it feels to be a student and not to be able to do something. And, you know, students struggle because they're coming to you to learn it. Um, so that that feeling of I can't do it and I don't know what I'm doing and I'm not quite sure. Um, that's something a lot of instructors forget because they can do it. They do know how to do it. They know exactly right. what they're doing and they forget that you know, students don't know what they're doing. If they, if they knew what they're doing, they wouldn't need to come to you as, as an instructor. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, it, exactly. And uh, what was it? I think uh, last year I finally got around to taking a GUE fundamentals class and 
it, it was I loved it so much because it was basically just working on the basics and stuff and seeing it from a new perspective and new eyes and everything. And it was it was such a fun class. And I really encourage a lot of people doesn't matter if you've been diving for 20 years, you know, go and taking a different class, a new class, even if it seems very basic and below, you know, you still don't know what you're going to learn. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Right, right, right. Well, cool. Um, you know, uh, something that really, uh, you know, kind of that first introduced me to your name was your book, you know, Deco for Divers. I think I got my copy in 2009. And, um, you know, it was, it really became a really important book to me. And uh, especially when explaining and learning about decompression and stuff. And so it, I almost kind of integrated it like a textbook. Mm -hmm. And so what, uh, what led you into writing Deco for Divers? Uh, well, the original, um, not so much the idea of it, but the, the, the very start uh, germ is, is when I started to get into technical diving. And I wanted to find out a little bit more about DECO. And, mm -hmm. you know, you look at the, the entry level uh, diving courses and decompression theory is covered in just a few uh, few paragraphs and then as you go into technical diving th there's just very or at least when I got into technical diving there was very little um, more available that was beyond that, that that went into more detail um, unless you went and looked at the scientific papers the original papers and even those were hard to get you know I remember um, going halfway across London to a university library uh, in order to find a, a copy of Haldane's original uh, paper um, you know, nowadays it's a lot easier with the uh, with the internet, mm -hmm. but uh, it was just almost impossible to get this information. Um, so it was it was such a struggle for me to find out a little bit about, more about decompression. And then when I started teaching, and my students were in exactly the same position, um, I decided to put together some notes, and it really was just a set of notes for the the deco procedures uh, class. And the mm -hmm. notes sort of grew and grew and grew, and um, Students would ask me, oh, this is great, but is there a book that, you know, that covers all this material? And after you've said no, there's no book that covers the material that I've written down. You know, after you've said that 50 times, you think, actually, maybe <laughs> there's an opportunity here. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, the, the book really grew out of the notes. Now, obviously, you know, I needed to extend it a bit, do a bit more research, you know, right. get all the references. Refine things a little. Exactly, Yeah. Um, and so, yeah, that's where, where it came from. It, it's effectively my course notes that grew and grew and grew uh, until uh, they formed the, the complete book. Yeah, it's, you know, if anyone hasn't read it yet, I always recommend it, you know, because it, it really it uh, it really kind of uh, makes things straightforward and easier to digest initially. So you can kind of really build that fundamental uh, build a really good understanding uh, for um, kind of a little bit of decompression science and so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's really where the, the name came from because, you know, in the entry-level manuals, it's decompression for non-divers. You know, mm -hmm. you know nothing about decompression. This is the introduction. And then all the scientific papers are, is decompression for researchers and for, you know, right. math geeks and rocket scientists. There's nothing aimed at someone who's already a diver, but, you know, a, a, a fairly new diver and wants to know a little bit more or someone who wants to get into to technical diving so yeah it's written to be understandable i'm not a researcher i'm not a mathematician um i had to work hard to to understand it um so i've tried to um put that in a way that people can understand without having to put all of that effort in right right it's it's uh yeah like it's easy to it's easy to digest and so it can really introduce you to terms that like okay well all right now this makes sense so now it like bridges the knowledge gap into the more technical papers more technical discussions yep. and so cool it's um now since it's been what like we said earlier 12 years since they've written mm -hmm. the book how has the discussion of decompression diving ch changed or grown at all it's the fundamentals aren't really changing topics, but you know, you have different things such as like gradient factors and you know even uh, deep stops. You know yep. it, that can be kind of a vague term. You know how has that changed since since when you released that book? Well, I think um, in a way I was uh, you know I might try and claim it was uh, forward thinking or good planning, but actually I was just really lucky. Um, mm -hmm. 
2008, I think, was a really good time to publish that book because the the whole idea of deep stops had uh, had come in um, five years ago, and uh, you know I would have missed all of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so it was a good time to, to 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 publish it, and then very little happened for for a good number of years after that. You know, people would ask me, "Are you going to do a, an update or a, a, another version?" And I'd say that there's not really much uh, that's changed. But now, within the last couple of years, all of a sudden, uh, the discussion has start, has moved on uh, a little bit. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> the um, you know, the the I, I published the book at pretty much uh, coming up to the, the the high water mark of bubble models and deep stop um, uh, ideas, mm-hmm. and then the U.S. Navy study in 2011 started right. off a, a discussion that has has caused us to revisit the whole idea of uh, of deep stops um so i think we're going through that process at the moment uh where you know we you know we really are talking about what is the uh, the best thing to do um and the the chips haven't completely fallen in the right places yet but i think you can sort of start to see the pattern um so i'm starting to work on a um it's not even a new version, but just a new chapter uh, to add to the book of, you know, if effectively extending out the, the deep stops uh, idea. Um, oh, yeah, a You're in a cave. Okay. Yep. So uh, the lights have gone off in the car. <laughs> <laughs> little technical difficulty. There, no we, go. there, you there go. go. there we go. Yeah. Um, you, you know, um, Earlier this year, uh, a few months ago, I saw your uh, live stream that you did with the Diver Medic mm-hmm. on uh, the thinking on deep stops. And, you know, I, I kind of saw it uh, very briefly. And then recently I kind of really s- s- watched it and, you know, took notes. And, yeah, your discussion on it was very interesting how, um, you know, the approach, it's, it's really, you know, anything to one extreme is never good. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's always kind of a balance and a combination of factors. You know, uh, you also said how, um, you know, the diving profile is one aspect to yeah. uh, DCS. And that's something that's not discussed very much. You know, uh, the very common theme that I'm hearing across a lot of people is that um, thermal limitations are really a big impact. This, I know Neil Pollock uh, talked about it on our live stream as well, too. So. Yeah, uh, that's that's a really good point. I mean, everybody gets so fixated on the dive profiles and you'll have literally discussions on dive forums that go on for hundreds and hundreds of pages about, you know, which gradient factors we should be selecting. Uh, and yet things like hydration, fitness, um, you know, thermal considerations. Uh, Neil uh, did a really uh, good paper that summed up all those things. In fact, I, I use one of his diagrams in uh, my deco lectures that shows that yes you got you got over here you've got the the dive profile stuff and there's all this other stuff around right. that which is as big a contributor um and yeah we we get obsessed with the the deep stops argument but we forget the uh the rest um but and also i think uh you know we've fallen into that trap the term deep stops uh, i think is getting to the point now where it's it's almost counterproductive because Deep stops mm-hmm. mean so many different things to uh, to different people. You know, the original pile stops, um, you know, bubble models generate uh, deep stops. Gradient factors have deep stops. But none of those things are the same. So saying right. you know, deep stops different. are a good yeah. thing or a bad thing is meaningless. So, uh, you know, I, I, and also you can you can go, as you said, you can go too far to the other extreme. I've heard people say, oh, you know, deep stops are a bad thing. No, no one that really knows what they're talking about is saying that. Um, what a lot of people say is that deep stops that are too deep is a bad thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but, you know, a deep stop, if you look at you know, one of the definitions, is any stop below what a traditional model would give you. Well, mm-hmm. stopping three meters below your traditional model, just adding in a little bit of conservatism, three meters or 10 foot uh, deep- next yeah, that's that's a deep stop, and that's almost certainly a good thing. Um, so yeah, I think we've we've got to take the and, and part of that um, that live stream was to do just that is to take the discussion on to the to the next level. I you know I'd quite like to get rid of the term uh, deep stops and instead be a little bit more precise about what do we mean. You know, if um, 
if you're, you know, if your your first traditional stop is here, then a deep stop there is probably a good thing. A deep stop down there um, is is probably a bad thing. Still um, part so of yeah, diet, think, right? yeah. Mm -hmm. exactly. Yeah, yeah. And you know, you can take it to its logical extreme. A deep stop that's so deep it's actually on the bottom is obviously uh, a deep thing. It is obviously a bad thing. Let's go even further. What, you know, may, if deep stops are so good, maybe we should, we should do our first stop deeper than the maximum depth. Okay, so clearly you can take things uh, too far. So right, right. Yeah, you know, I think the 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 discussion shouldn't be whether deep stops are a good or a bad thing, but what's the right depth to start uh, our stops. Right, and you know, something that you did on that live stream was that you um, granted, like, you definitely kind of define started defining and kind of categorizing what is a deep stop, and you were able to categorize it. By showing like, okay, this gradient factor, uh, if you go off of this profile, it looks like this. This gradient factor looks like that and, and so whatnot. And um, that was the first time that I've seen anyone kind of defining the profile. Mm -hmm. And the gradient factors do such a really good job of really kind of putting right on the spot where, uh, you know, a deep stop could be or kind of uh, different profiles. Yeah. And so, and that really kind of, illustrated the differences on um the profiles yeah and and it's easy to do you know um software planning tools things like uh, multi t goes uh, is great for this do a dive profile your normal uh whatever it is 200 foot dive 60 meter dive um and then run it with a 2080 gradient factor and then mm -hmm. 3080 and then 4080 and 5080 and see what difference it makes and it, it puts it into context. The other thing, of course, is if you're doing this for a 100-foot dive or a 30-meter dive, the gradient factors make virtually no difference uh, whatsoever. So, yeah, it puts it into, into context as to what is, you know, changing this by 10% on our, our gradient factor low, what impact does that actually have on our, our dive? Right, right. And I think also another um, something that I, I'm not sure if you've heard uh, or if it's been discussed very much is, you know, should you dive different gradient factors or should you dive different profiles with the rebreather versus open circuit? You know, with, you know, an open circuit, if you're doing gas switches, you kind of have the PO2 spikes versus on CCR, your PO2 is stable or relatively stable uh, throughout the dive, you know. Is it with there, you know, differences on that? And I, I don't know if I haven't heard if it's been discussed very much or if it even contributes or whatnot. So, yeah, the, I mean, there's there's plenty of discussion about it uh, amongst divers. Um, there's very little actual uh, evidence as to the 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 the, the, the differences. Um, yeah, personally, I tend to set, dive the same gradient factors uh, whether I'm doing a gas switch or or not. Um, I tend to use the same gradient factors on open circuit and uh, a rebreather. Now that's partly because I don't want to have to keep changing my uh, my, my computer sure. to have the different gradient right, factors. Right. Keep it simple. Um, but also, if you think about you know the the loading in your body doesn't really know how it got there or why it got there, right. you know, what the technology that that, it, that got there. So I'm I'm not convinced that the the technology that we're using to generate the gas that we're breathing whether it's open circuit or rebreather or open circuit and multiple gases really has that much of a, of an impact. Um, so yeah, I tend to use the same, uh, same gradient factors. Now, um, again, you know, as, as it comes to gradient factors, if, uh, there's some research in the future that says, actually there is a real uh, benefit of doing this on open circuit, but doing something different on a rebreather, I'll, I'll switch. Um, right, so, right. Yeah, I think I think it's really important when it comes to um, decompression research, other areas as well. But let's stick to decompression research to keep an eye on uh, what's going on, keep an eye on the developments, and change your practices um, according to you know what the, the the best thinking is. I, I dive very differently to when I started um, to learn to dive in the uh, in the late eighties. Um, I do. I dive very differently. And I do very different deco to when I started doing technical diving in the late '90s. Um, you know, things move on. My equipment has moved on. Um, my, you know, and again, you know, we we mentioned it earlier. In the late '90s, there's no way I'd be sitting in my car uh, doing a presentation like this on my phone 
uh, over a you know mobile phone signal. So if, if we moved on this mm -hmm. much here to the other side of the world, exactly, yeah. yeah. Um, so if we've moved on so much here, you know, why not move on our diving practices the same uh, same way? Right, uh, I hundred percent agree. The um, now, what's rare though is when you have uh, when you have people that are kind of influencers and they are advocate a big advocate of one particular way of doing something, mm -hmm. and then you know it's so hard for them to change because of all the different pressures that go into you know like oh well, you used to say rebreathers are going to kill everyone. Now you're teaching on rebreathers, yeah. and it's you know. It's important to be able to be like, well, you know, I was wrong then. I've, you know, I've seen different benefits and I have changed my position on that. It's just, it's a, a little bit uh, rare these days, I think. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah, it, it's hard to do, but I think it, it depends on how you phrase it in the first place. Uh, you know, yeah. if you say, this is the answer and I'm 100% sure about this and no one's ever going to convince me that I'm wrong and you're an idiot if you believe anything different. <laughs> you're really committing. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it is quite hard to back off from that. Um, but if you yeah. say, well, this is what the, the research that I've read uh, from people I respect, this is what it seems to imply. But, you know, I'm open minded. And, and also, I mean, one of the other things that really scared me when I started uh, researching uh, deco for divers is you read the actual scientific papers behind a lot of the things that we now consider to be golden rules. And what mm -hmm. it actually says is something like, well, it appears that this might be true Maybe. in a limited number of cases. Um, of course, uh, in other situations, something might happen and we don't really understand this bit. Um, and what that gets interpreted as is this is true. And they you know, we, we lose all the other caveats. So the original researchers that did that research were, were nowhere near as uh, confident uh, about that as, right. as you are. So, yeah, you, you're setting yourself up for a fall in that in that situation. So I think, you know, if you if you if you keep an open mind on things and say, well, yeah, best guess at the moment is this. But I'm willing to uh, to listen to any better evidence that, that comes along. Then then it's a little bit easier to um, to, to back uh uh, to, to to back away, to kind of back to up a little bit, right, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah it, it was it was real science, you know. They were like, "Well, we have a theory on this. We think mm -hmm. it's this way," you know. And and so we'll see over time how it prevails. And so, yeah, the um, yeah, it's and you also brought up a really interesting uh, uh, point that you know a lot of people say like, "Well, I adjusted my gradient factors to forty seventy five, and now I feel." Uh, a lot more after diving, you know. Yeah, yeah. And so that and so that's, what, what do you what does that mean? I think that that's really interesting, and that opens up a whole extra area of discussion because you know, for those of us that have uh, been around a while and have seen a lot of these changes, you know, I remember when pile stops first came out, and Richard Pile. One of the arguments that uh, Richard Pile. Um, uh, put you know because he's a fish scientist he, he wasn't coming mm -hmm. at this from a a, a a deco research point of view uh, he said i feel better when i when i do this and that almost became the benchmark you know i feel better when i when i do this um and we went from uh you know from traditional bullman to, to deep stops and then deeper and then deeper and then deeper and every time people said i feel better i feel better i feel better and um, and then when the U.S. Navy study came in, you know, we jumped back up a little bit and people said, oh, and now I feel better. And we went you know, a little bit more uh, shallower and shallower. And each time they felt better. We've gone this big circle, come back to where we started and people felt better with each and every step. So that can't be true. That can't happen. Yeah, you can't feel reliable. better and come back to where you were uh, previously. And, you know, this whole thing about... Um, you know, the way you feel. I, I, I'm not a big fan of that uh, at all. I think um, there's so many other things that go into how you feel. You know, if you've been, if, you, if you're diving on a boat and it's four hours out to get to the dive site and then you're doing a four hour dive and then another four hours to get back, I'm going to be pretty gonna... tired at the end of that, <laughs> no matter what deco I do. Um, you know, if it's a flat, calm sea, I might feel better. If it's bumpy on the way back, uh, you know, and cold, I might feel feel worse. Uh, you know, if I'm uh, if I was exercising the day before, I might feel better or worse. Depending. So there's so many other 
variables. Um, and lastly, um, what really worries me about that is I don't want to be pushing my deco to the point where I can actually feel it. Um, if you That's can point, feel yeah. it, if you can feel that I don't feel quite <laughs> right, how close are you away from um, from a, from a bend? So if you're fine tuning it based on that, I think you're far too uh, far too close. Um, so yeah, I'm not a big believer in the uh, you know follow your body or how do you feel after the dive or you know uh, reduce your safety margins until you start to get a bit uh, a bit niggly. Um, I think that is uh, yeah. Uh, not scientific and you know potentially dangerous right right like you said it's it's probably right on the line of something you know mm -hmm. yeah and if you're if you're there you're you're too close because you know you it's it's a gray zone it's not a hard line between bubble and no yeah. bubble exactly uh, yeah. maybe there's something here maybe there's something there it's um but uh, you know to all our viewers i really recommend you know, taking a look at the the video, the thinking on deep stops. It's a it's a very good one. So, but um, you know, getting you know getting into based of how we feel, I you know I think in the last couple of years, especially with this year, uh, with um, you know Gareth's uh, book, um, Human Factors, uh, it's um, the uh, we're finding how you know the faulty part of a lot of this is the human on this mm -hmm. aspect. And so there's so many contributing factors that go into um, the way we do our diving all the way from, uh, you know, getting the course set up or doing uh, getting your diving set up, your, your building back at home to, to splashing, to being in the water, to getting out of the water. You know, there's the human element that is, is faulty and we're trying, we, the best way to kind of combat that and mitigate the risk mm -hmm. is to, build in um, factors that will kind of counteract those uh, human factors of it. So if that makes any sense. Yeah. It does. Yeah. I mean, it's something that I've, um, I've always believed that, um, you know, th when you're, when you're teaching diving, it's not just about teaching the skills um, in the, in the human factors terminologies, the, the technical skills. Uh, it's about teaching the soft skills or the interpersonal skills and, you know, so perfect example of that from from today. Um, I've spent a lot of today um, helping people reach their valves or send up delayed SMBs. But the biggest part of um, today was about how people approach their, their dives. Um, you know, one uh, we had one student that um, uh, is a perfectionist and wants everything to be perfect and was basically focusing so much on this being perfect that they Perception forgot to look at, at this. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and so their, their perfectionism and wanting everything to be right is actually what's causing things to go wrong. Um, and so, you know, pointing that out to them, uh, and first thing as an instructor, spotting that, that's what the problem yeah. is and pointing it out to them was the most useful thing I can do rather than focusing on the details of the individual uh, skill. Um, and then the other one, um, is, is teamwork. You know, a big part of what we were focusing on today was how these guys work as a team. And uh, it's very easy. You set up uh, a scenario where if they don't work as a team, things are going to go wrong and keep going, keep getting worse. If they work as a team, it'll go easily. Um, and so, yeah, um, both of the debriefs I did today after the dives, 90% of it was um, interpersonal teamwork um, skills, you know, human human factors. So I think it's, um, you know, uh, you, you mentioned um, uh, earlier the, the talk I did about why, uh, why people do stupid things. Um, right, and right. That, that's something that I've always focused on. And I think um, uh, most uh, diving instructors do. We may not call it human factors, but that's effectively what we're uh, what we're doing. Um, and, yeah, you know, exactly. it, it's easy. Um, you could stop the vast majority of diving accidents tomorrow. All you have to do is one thing. You have to make sure that people follow their training. Right. Easy. They just follow their training. Simple, the, yeah. the majority of these things will, will disappear. And yet it doesn't happen. And that and that's because um, because we're human. You know, why do we make um, human errors? Because we're, we're human. Um, and recognizing that it's actually it's 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 common. It's not unusual. It's common.
for people to have these sorts of things. You know, um, one of the questions I get asked uh, more more than anything else, and, and one of my students asked me this today, um, is, you know, are, are we the worst you've seen? Uh, you know, does everybody do this? Uh, yeah, everybody do this. Everybody does this. Yeah. Uh, everybody gets fixated on little things and, and misses the uh, the big picture. So, yeah, as, as instructors, I think we've got to recognize uh, that and, and deal with it. Um, it's easy right. to make a student look and feel good by giving them an easy problem to solve. But try and do that when they've got to um, you know, stay together as a team or manage a number of um, problems. And they've got to prioritize which one should I be focusing on first that's what we should really be doing in order to um uh, uh in order to improve divers and i think what's interesting is that you know coming from a uh, from tdi we started off as a tech diving agency and that mm -hmm. is just in our dna you know multiple problems um accident analysis you know technical diving right. you know started off with accident analysis that's where the uh, you know the rules of cave diving came from it, right. you know, so the it's blueprint. in our DNA. Um, and so for us, for TDI, it's very easy to pass that mentality on to SDI um, because SDI is the, the recreational arm. Well, right. we, we're, we're looking at it with the same mentality. Uh, so I think it, it's a lot easier for us to do that than some other agencies which, which don't have that technical diving uh, mindset. Right, exactly. I mean, it's a it's a top down approach in, in terms of like, you know, the you started out here. Okay, we're going to carry these uh, fact or these habits or these kind of elements to our the philosophy. We're going to carry it down in order into the sport world. And I think I think we are seeing a lot of that. You're seeing a lot of, um, you know, purely recreational divers kind of uh, start to exhibit more technical um habits patterns you know you'll see a lot of people diving with the back plate in a single wing uh with recreational diving and i think you know that's good it's a you know it's just a it's just a you can see that they're either a they're either doing it because it looks good or b you know because like okay maybe they're integrating the philosophy into mm -hmm. their sport or recreational yeah. diving so yeah, and uh, you know, I'm not trying to say that every open water diver should be diving in a in doubles and a and a stage cylinder. So you know, we certainly don't want to take everything from technical diving and put it into recreational diving. But there are a few things, right. um, and you know, a backplate is a perfect example. Why shouldn't recreational divers use a uh, a backplate? Um, um, I, I wrote a uh, a blog for the for the SDI uh, blog. Mm -hmm which I think is coming out in January on exactly that, that topic. Um, and, you know, you hear people say, oh, well, BCDs are the standard. We should, we should only be using the standard or we should be using what our students are, are diving. Well, again, BCDs have only been the standard for the last couple of years. When I started mm -hmm. diving, and I'm going to have to stop saying this, it's making me sound really old, but when I started diving, a lot of people, uh, or the majority of people were still using Fenzi ABLJs, you know, the old life, Horse um, collar, horse collar, like, yeah. um, and that was the standard. So if we said you've got to stick with the standard, we would never have gone to BCDs. But right. BCDs had a lot of advantages over ABLJs. Had some disadvantages as well. And people said you shouldn't use BCDs. It's not a life jacket. It won't float They're you. They're going to hold your head out of the water. Up. Exactly. Um, mm -hmm. But the the advantages of BCDs so much uh, outweighed. The disadvantages that we switch and again we're going through that process now with uh back plates and harness and wings there's some fantastic mm -hmm. advantages to uh to recreational divers there's some disadvantages yeah but there's some um some advantage and if those advantages outweigh the disadvantage why shouldn't we uh switch to uh, to that exactly uh, so yeah about... some of the equipment okay. stuff um and but but the mindset as well um and mm -hmm. you know and unfortunately, too many recreational divers have got this mindset that they hope everything will go well. Okay, and <laughs> to be fair, and you know, luckily, most of the times diving is very safe. Most of the time, it does go well. Um, but then they're not prepared for those couple of times when it doesn't go well. So technical divers assume it will go badly, plan for that, and are thankful when uh, when it doesn't go badly. So you know, that's a that's a, a good uh, mentality to to adopt. Right, right. It's um, 
you know that kind of leads uh, kind of leads a segue into you know uh, talking about equipment and so how equipment has changed over time especially electronics has changed over time I mean I know sometimes the displays on my computers are so bright I can use it almost like a backup light mm -hmm. you know yeah so, and that was unheard of you know ten years ago and yeah. so with the equipment being so robust and um, with kind of that shifting now um, it's um, is that gonna are we do we see equipment replacing you know I, I don't know if you would say are you seeing equipment replacing skills or um, versus kind of in the old you know I think it's like nowadays when I see people uh, I think recently I saw this um, this uh, person she was diving uh, without a computer and she was doing you know deep dives and doing things off tables and you know bottom timers and that's it and I was like oh wow I was like it's not very common anymore you know mm -hmm. You know, exactly. you know, are those skills going to get lost and be replaced or what? Um, I think they'll they'll change um, <laughs> because, uh, as you say, that's not very common anymore. You know, most people have got uh, a, you know, if they're doing technical diving, they've got a gas mix computer that's got adjustable right. gradient factors. Um, <clears throat> and uh, a lot of times they've got a backup as well, which will do the, yeah. the same thing as well. So. Um, you know, if you if you think back to why we we teach these things, you know, we we teach people to follow a written plan um, because 20 years ago, that was the only option. They had right. they had a, a written plan and a bottom timer because there was nothing else uh, available. Um, and then some computers started to uh, to be available, um, but they were really expensive and they weren't that reliable. So you could have one, um, but you certainly wouldn't have two. Uh, you'd have one and they weren't that reliable so you know right. there would be there was a, a very real chance that you'd look at your wrist and it's blank um so yeah. you'd have to switch to your bottom timer in your, your table so you still needed to use the bottom timer and the, and the tables um whereas now you've got two computers on your wrist so one of them you know th th they're much more reliable so the chances mm -hmm. of one of them failing is very very s slight OK, um, but still happens uh, and we've still got a plan for that. So one of them fails and you go to your backup. Um, so why do I need a, a written set of tables in mm -hmm. uh, uh, in that case? I'm just going to use the, the backup computer. Now, I can see the um, uh, the uh, the old timers uh, that are watching this are going, oh, yeah, but what if the second one fails? Uh, then I get my um, my wet notes out with my plan written on it. And, and how do I? do my time or my depth now because you know what am i going to do carry a third uh, bottom timer as well um you know if going back to the, to the old days uh, if i had a, a computer and a bottom timer what if my bottom timer failed so when right. you're looking at failures you've got to look at what's realistic what are the chances of your computer failing uh, what is the chance of your second computer failing astronomical so if right. it's never going to happen or you know um why are we uh, why are we planning for it? So I think what that means is that not that the skills will go away, skills will change because mm -hmm. dive planning, if you're using two computers, is different to dive planning if you're using tables. Um, you know, there, there's a different set of uh, considerations. Your limiting factors are going to be slightly, uh, slightly different. Um, and so, yeah, I don't think these skills are going to go away. They're going to they're going to change. Um, in the same way as you know, in in um, in any other area, you know, driving a car, nobody knows how to change the spark plugs on their car anymore because the equipment's right, right. changed. Yeah. Um, you know, it's it's just not relevant on the vast majority of, uh, of modern cars. Um, and uh, you know, go back any further, nobody knows how to start their car without you know that wheel, that handle, that crank oh, the hand crank. The, at the front. Because the they think you roll your window down. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, shouldn't we still teach that just in case? No, because it's just never going to happen. So, right. yeah, I think uh, that's a responsibility um, of, uh, you know, training agencies. And that's one of the things I, um, I like getting involved with at, at TDI is right. that we're constantly looking at the courses and saying, well, what should we be teaching? Um, you know, how should things adapt to, uh, to match equipment and procedural? And environmental and any other 
changes that might affect how we do how we do diving. Um, the the worst thing that we can do is to say this is how you do this skill, um, and you can't do it any other way. Um, yeah. Uh, you know, a perfect example again coming back to the the back plate. Um, I you know this the article I'm talking about with the back plate was prompted by some questions I got from a from an instructor candidate, and they said, well, how do you do the um, uh, you know a kit remove and replace because you're supposed to do it like this and you can't do that in the back plate. No, the, the skill doesn't determine the equipment. The equipment should determine the skill. If you've got slightly different equipment, you're going to need to do the skill in a you slightly different way. The goal is not to follow steps A, B, and C. The goal is to remove and replace the equipment safely and confidently. If you need to do that by doing A, C, B instead of A, B, C. That's the way it should be. Um, and yeah, uh, again, with with SDI, there's a flexibility in how we do things. We don't mandate that you have to do the scale ABC. Um, if it if it ACB works better, then that's the way you should be doing it. Right. You have to look at the goal, the end goal of it, and how to get there. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Now, in in speaking of computers and kind of how they've changed, um, in also you, even in terms of training, uh, with you know we focus uh, primarily on rebreathers. And so more kind of the advanced technical equipment. And so I know that uh, I think recently you guys, uh, you were part of a panel that was working on, you know, rebreather uh, st kind of training standardization. You know, are there, do you have any insight on that? Um, yeah. So uh, as part, part of my role at uh, TDI is I represent the agency on a number of uh, standards panels in the UK. Uh, well, every country has got its national standards uh, mm -hmm. agency. Uh, in the UK, it's BSI. So um, I am on that on that panel for equipment training. Uh, sorry, for uh, diver training and diver equipment. Um, and then each of those national agencies sends representatives to ISO, the International Standards uh, Organization, um, and mm -hmm. we're working on rebreather standards. So. There are representatives from all over the world um, and um, people like myself, but also representatives from other training agencies, manufacturers, uh, all, all come together to, to go through how can we come up with a standard to make sure that everybody is um, teaching in a, um, uh, in a safe way. Um, and what's really interesting about this process is that with the, a lot of the open circuit standards uh you know the recreational scuba standards what mm -hmm. we've done is th the standards were basically brought down to the lowest common denominator um race to the bottom with the rebreather standards yeah exactly race to the bottom um what we've done with the rebreather standards is try and and raise the bar um so you know with the with the recreational uh, scuba standards the uh, the unsaid assumption was let's not leave anyone out um which means that we've you know you, you've got um standards which are not uh, really pushing forward whereas the rebreather standards right. we've now got a, a set of standards that really do raise the uh, the bar i think almost every agency is going to have to change something in order to to meet those you know tdi does more rebreather certs than, than any other agency so we could have said right well this is what we uh, do and you know we're not going to go any higher than that but actually, we're going to be bumping up some of our standards to, to, to meet this because we've seen, well, yeah, this is an area where we do need to do more. We can see uh, where some of the accidents are happening in rebreather. So let's uh, improve that area to try and get rid of that, that problem. Uh, so it's a, it's a really positive uh, process. Right. As I said, all the major uh, manufacturers, all the major training agencies are working together to try and uh, raise these, uh, these standards. So yeah, it's uh, it's sitting on a, a two day long conference call is not the most exciting thing, but you know it's it's uh, it's worth it in the long run to try and improve rebreather standards. Right, right. I mean, you know, these things need to be uh, are important to happen in order to keep things, you know, as sharp as they can be, as effective, and you know, to yeah. minimize the amount of risk, so that yeah. we're, we build robust, you know, dive training for divers and so it, it really the end goal is to really you know exactly build good divers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's you know it's in all of our interest um uh you know from a commercial point of view as well as a manufacturer 
Divesoft doesn't want rebreathers to get this reputation of being uh, unreliable or dangerous. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, as a training agency, we don't want uh, rebreathers to get to get that reputation. Uh, in, and in the past, you know, rebreathers have had a, a bad reputation. And right. it's not the rebreathers. You know, the rebreathers weren't, um, you know, faulty or they weren't, uh, uh, you know, it, it wasn't that rebreathers are inherently dangerous. It wasn't the training. Um, mm-hmm. It's the combination of everything. And it's about creating that, again, coming back to the human factors, about creating right. the right uh, attitude to uh, to divers. Um, so, you know, the standards have got things in there about the importance of doing buddy checks. Um mm-hmm. Uh, so, for example, you know, one of the things that uh, bugs me no end is when people dive together as a buddy pair and one of them has a problem. So they go up on their own, um, which just uh-huh. uh, irritates me so much because you're diving as a buddy team just in case something goes wrong. Something goes wrong. Something what do you do? You wrong. split up. So <laughs> um, so now in the, the draft standard we've put together um, in there, it says, you know, you have to teach that if one goes up, the other one goes up. Okay. Now, doesn't mean that divers will necessarily do that. As we've said already, you know, if divers followed all of their training, they, they wouldn't have problems. But the, the more of these things that we emphasize, I think the, the better chance we've got of creating safer, safer divers. So, yeah, sitting for two days on a Zoom call, um, I think it's a worthwhile investment uh, if we can you know, change one event. If, if, if these standards help save one life, one rebreather diver's life, then I am all for it. Right, right. Yeah, exactly. I mean, it's an investment. And so it's, um, you know, like you were saying about the reputation of rebreathers, how in the past they have had, you know, same as nitrox as the voodoo gas, you know, the rebreathers were kind of painted as these dangerous black boxes. And so, um, and do you, do you think that, uh, you know, since, you know, over the past, 10, 20 years have rebreathers become more robust? You know, the electronics become more robust and, you know, are electronic CCRs a little bit more reliable than they used to be? You know, is that playing a role into this? I think so. Yeah, definitely. Um, You know, if you look at just the way that electronics have come on in the last 20 years, undoubtedly it's more, it's more reliable. Um, (laughs) So, yeah, I think there's no doubt about it. Modern rebreathers are more, uh, are, are more reliable. Um, the the flip side of that is as they get more complicated, sometimes that can introduce more uh, failures. But I think as the equipment has uh, become more sophisticated, the training that goes with it has become more sophisticated. You know, we've got right. uh, a, a depth of uh, of knowledge. Um, you know, now, um, you know. 20 years ago we didn't have 20 years worth of experience of teaching rebreathers yeah now we do um so there's a there's a lot more um experience you know we've got 20 years of seeing the mistakes that people make on rebirth well actually close to 30 years now uh we've got that experience of seeing the the mistakes that people make so i think the um the training's got better the um the equipment has got better the support around it uh again you know you go back 10, 20, even 30 years, there weren't, uh, there wasn't that support structure around rebreather divers. They didn't have an experienced diver to go and talk to. Um, you know, part of the reason why rebreathers got such a bad reputation in the, in the first place is the people that were buying it were very, very experienced open circuit tech divers who wanted a rebreather because basically their, tr- their helium builds are too high. So they bought a rebreather, did a couple of dives, and went to 300 foot or 100 meters the next weekend um, and got into, into trouble. Uh, you know, we've learned now that that doesn't really work as well, and you need to, to build up to it. Um, and what's happening now is that people are starting earlier with rebreathers. The great thing is then that means that they build up more experience with that rebreather. So by the time they get to... Uh, 300 foot or 100 meters, they've got a couple of years experience of the of the rebreather rather than a couple of weeks uh, experience. So yeah, I think that the whole infrastructure around rebreathers has got more um, more sophisticated. Does depend on um, on where you are. Uh, you know, I'm lucky diving in the UK. We've got several manufacturers uh, here in the UK. So um, you know, we we've 
there's been a strong culture. Uh, the US as well, um, there's a strong culture of, of using rebreathers, maybe not as much as in the UK, but then other countries, um, Spain, uh, for example, there's very little rebreather use in Spain. Um, it's it's still seen as uh, as cutting edge. So yeah, I think it depends uh, on where you are. But yeah, in 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 general, definitely the equipment has got more reliable, the training has got more reliable, and and most places the uh, the support network has got more reliable as well. Right, right. Yes. Sorry about that. I got thrown off a, a little bit, but you know, yeah, uh, that's um, all right. We um we we manage without you. Yeah, yeah. You don't even need me here, so. <laughs> The um, no, you know, I think the equipment has just, has become so has become more reliable, and that's a you know, it's like um, the way cell phones. I think in in when they first started uh, coming out, they you know had all sorts of problems, and then you know now you have these smartphones that have so much capability. You know, mm -hmm. does that are they more prone to failing or having problems? I don't think so. I think they're very reliable and they're very more capable even though they're more complicated and yeah, so yeah. um you know to kind of you know pushing the philosophy you know you very much have the philosophy like oh the simple the most simple mechanism is going to be the most robust and it was like well you know you also have these systems that have been getting tested and tested and people have been putting time on them and they're becoming very robust and very reliable and so it's um it's i think it's a really exciting time Mm -hmm. what we're yeah. seeing in driving equipment definitely yeah right right well um you know uh, so what are you seeing kind of in the future in terms of equipment and diving techniques and in, in you know let's say in rebreathers um well i think you know following on from what we were just talking about uh one of the reasons why rebreathers have got more reliable is that we've now got a lot more experience but what we've got really is experience in terms of incrementally changing the basic design you know there's there's nothing fundamentally different um you know we've got galvanic oxygen sensors we've got softener line we've got some plumbing um you know you draw a schematic of almost any rebreather and it looks very similar right, um right. So, and and, you know, and that's a good thing because it's meant that technology is allowed to catch up. The reliability is there. Uh, but now I think uh, what's going to be next is looking at alternatives. And um, uh, sensors are, uh, to me, are the big uh, problem with rebreathers. The mm -hmm. uh, you know, galvanic oxygen sensors are inherently unreliable. It's not a matter of when or it's not a matter of if it's going to fail. It's a matter of when, when. it will fail. Mm -hmm. You know, and you know, maybe it'll last uh, 18 months, um, and you replace it on schedule, but it may fail uh, before that. And, um, you know, we spend so much time teaching people how to deal with um, oxygen cell failures. Solve the problem with oxygen cells, and all of a sudden, things go um, go away. Uh, you know, Poseidon have announced their solid-state uh, sensors. Um, when they become mainstream, um, whether it's the Poseidon ones or uh, another iteration of that, when they become mainstream, all of a sudden, a lot of the problems that we're going to have with rebreathers and, again, coming back to our discussion earlier, a lot of the skills. Why do you need to teach someone how to do a calibration if you've had a factory calibrated um, sensor that never needs calibration? Right. So that whole area of um, teaching the skill, knowing the problems uh, to watch out, all of that disappears. Um, mm -hmm. Why do we need to um, be aware of sensor failures when you don't have that current limiting? Um, you know, why do we need to be worrying about millivolts when these things are much more uh, reliable? Yeah. So, yeah, for me, mm -hmm. sensors are the, uh, are the big area. Uh, if we can crack that, it opens up a whole range of, uh, of other things. Right, right. I mean, the hardest thing I think is to bringing things that don't like water underwater. That's mm -hmm. the biggest yeah. problem, right? Yeah, and and again, you know, uh, there's advantages and disadvantages. One of the, the great things about uh, oxygen sensors is they produce power. Great, you know, cuts down the power uh, requirements. Um, so yeah, there's a there's a reason we're using them, but I think there are um, uh, there are definitely disadvantages. 
Well, great, great. It's um, yeah, it's um, I think, like I said earlier, it's an exciting time. And I think there's, you know, more discussions coming up, especially um, solid state sensors, um, bailout rebreathers. I think that's a topic mm -hmm. that, you know, I know with uh, Bill Stone back in the 80s was de designing his cislunar with dual rebreathers. And then, you know, the range he had on it was incredible. And then now the conversation is coming back to using bailout rebreathers. Yep. And so yep. that's becoming a growing and growing topic. And so what are your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's uh, it's one of the things people buy rebreather and they say, oh, great. You know, I can get rid of all these uh, cylinders. I don't need the twin set. Don't mm -hmm. need all the stages. And um, and I would say, no, you know, think again. Yeah, if you're trying to get rid of all those stages, you're you're going down the wrong path. Um, and, that, you know, that that for deep diving is still the big limitation if i bail out at 120 meters how much open circuit gas do i need to, to get me back to the surface how many cylinders am i carrying that i am probably never going to use but i still need to carry them uh, mm -hmm. so yeah i think bailout rebreathers are uh, again one of the you know the new, the new frontiers for rebreathers um if we can uh get that problem sorted it opens up the deeper diving that doesn't matter for shallower diving you know it's uh, one two stages is fine um in terms of um uh, in terms of shallow diving but when you get to 120 meters when you uh, you know if i have a, a co2 hit at 120 meters um how much uh how much uh, gas am i going to need to go through um the bailout rebreather then takes away that, that consideration um right. Yeah, so that's interesting. Um, obviously, you know, different training considerations, different uses considerations. Um, also, uh, uh, different um, uh, standards considerations in terms of the, uh, the the way that we approve rebreathers. The um, CE standard for uh, rebreathers uh, was originally envisaged for back-mounted rebreathers. So mm -hmm. uh, how does that apply for side-mounted uh, rebreathers? So that's... Uh, some of the, the the problems we've uh, we've got to look at but uh, yeah none of them are insolvable it's just a a question of uh, a question of time and working through the problems right exactly yeah time and and you know discussion and, and working through the problems like you said mm -hmm. and, you know so cool well it's uh i think uh, we've kind of covered quite a lot of the topics and whatnot you know there's always so much more we can chat about but um, it looks like it's getting a little chilly on your on the windows as cars drive by. So <laughs> didn't want to keep you for too long. But I've also <laughs> realized that for anyone that's a, a Red Dwarf fan, um, I realized what the image looks like. I, I look like Holly from Red Dwarf um, with just a, a disembodied head. Oh, with the light. <laughs> well, like Mike said, we're talking heads now. So we've had. So. It's been a it's been a fun year. So, but we're uh, we're we're really happy here at DiveSoft that you were able to join us for uh, an episode of Dive Talks. And so, hopefully, we'll be able to get you on for maybe another episode, and we can kind of dive a little bit deeper into some more of these topics. Yeah, I'd be happy to. There's a whole range of other stuff that we haven't uh, even touched on yet. So, yeah, right, anytime. Right. I'd be glad to. Great to speak to you. Right. Well, great, and thanks again for joining us. Thank you, Michael, and. Uh, and uh, so thank you to everyone that joined and tuned in for uh, this week's episode of Dive Talks. You know, like I say, uh, join us next week. We've got a little special for you guys. And so don't be sure to miss out. Remember, it's going to be at the same time on Thursday. So 1 p.m. Eastern. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye.